Welcome to this morning's hall. In 2004, we began what has become one of Roxbury Latin's proudest traditions. Since the inception of the F. Washington Jarvis International Fund Lecture, we have welcomed 16 distinguished public servants and thinkers on foreign affairs, including economist Paul Volcker, Roxbury Latin alumni ambassadors Richard Murphy and Mark Storella, Robert Gates, former Secretary of Defense, Lisa Monaco, Homeland Security Advisor to President Obama, John Brennan, former director of the CIA, and last year, Professor William Taubman, who spoke to us about Russia, the former Soviet Union, and US relations with the country over many decades. Today, we host the 17th annual Jarvis Fund Lecture, named for the man who for 30 years led Roxbury Latin as its 10th headmaster, Mr. Tony Jarvis, who died two years ago this month. Those of us who knew Tony miss him very much, and all of us associated with Roxbury Latin owe him a debt of gratitude for transforming our school into the remarkable institution that it is today. We are so glad to have this lecture named for him as one way to remind us in perpetuity of his lasting impact. The genesis of this fund was twofold. First, the appreciation that alumnus Jack Hennessy, class of 1954, and his wife Margarita had for the distinguished work that Mr. Jarvis did during his time here. And second, their conviction that Americans in general and Roxbury Latin's teachers and students in particular to benefit from greater exposure to issues concerning the United States place in the world. The Hennessy's envisioned this fund helping to bring to the school distinguished thinkers on world affairs, as well as enabling the boys and faculty to experience firsthand by sending them out into the world cultures different from our own. Since the fund was established in 2004, hundreds of boys and masters have been afforded the opportunity to travel to foreign countries. As a result, they have developed new perspectives on many political, economic, historical and cultural issues. Annually, we offer opportunities for immersion in France and Spain, an in-residence scholar at England's Eton College and various other trips that take us to the world. If we were in the hall right now, I would ask those of you who had gone on a school-sponsored international trip to stand and about 85% of upperclassmen would do so. Finally, today, I wanna to recognize Jack and Margarita Hennessy who are with us on Zoom this morning. Mr. Hennessy is a member of the class of 1954 and a former member of RL's Board of Trustees. Both he and Mrs. Hennessy have throughout their lives represented an unusual engagement with other nations and cultures. Throughout their lives too, they have generously provided the philanthropic wherewithal in order that others might come to know and appreciate our flattening world. And as we all know, the Hennessy's have helped make possible in the IAF Hennessy rink. We look forward to the day that it hosts skaters and the Hennessy's once again. We're privileged this morning to welcome to Roxbury Latin as our honored guest, Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas. Ambassador Elam Thomas directs the University of Central Florida's diplomacy program, a rapidly growing global effort at the school's Office of Global Perspectives and International Initiatives. Prior to her joining UCF, she served as United States Ambassador to Senegal, home country of our own Monsieur Jop, and retired with the rank of career minister after 40 years as a diplomat. A member of the United States Foreign Service beginning in 1963, the ambassador also served as chief of mission to Guinea-Bissau, acting director of the United States Information Agency, and many other key diplomatic roles in Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, France, Mali, and the Ivory Coast. Born and raised in Roxbury, Ms. Elam Thomas earned her bachelor's degree in international business from Simmons College and a master's in public diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy from Tufts University. In 2015, she published the book, Diversifying Diplomacy, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar, in which she tells her story of following in the footsteps of the few women who had gone before her in her effort to make the Foreign Service reflect the diverse faces of the United States. The youngest child of parents who left the segregated South to raise their family in Massachusetts, Ms. Elam Thomas distinguished herself with a diplomatic career at a time when few colleagues looked like her. The book recounts her decades long career in the US Department of State's Foreign Service and her experiences of making US foreign policy, culture and values understood abroad. She is the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the US government's Superior Honor Award and the Lois Roth Award for Excellence in Informational and Cultural Diplomacy. Special thanks to alumnus Tenzin Thargay, class of 2014, for introducing us to the ambassador through his studies in international affairs at Columbia. 
Tenson is also joining us this morning on Zoom. Welcome, Tenson. Please help me in welcoming now then as our 17th Jarvis International Fund Lecturer, Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas. Merci. Bonjour. Kalimera merhaba to you, Headmaster Breton, and to all of your colleagues, and of course, to one of your most inspiring alums, Tenzin Tharge, for suggesting that I spend some time with you and be the Jarvis lecturer this morning. In this presentation, I will highlight the value of building relationships, mentorship, cultural competency, competency and civility. And the relations and building is the reason I came to know Tenzin as he works towards his master's degree in international relations in Colombia. His foreign service mentor happens to be Christopher Dada, a respected author and the first editor of my memoir. Chris is indeed a very special person because he served as deputy chief of mission at the embassy in Senegal. I left Dakar 17 years ago, so I've remained in close contact with Chris. And thank you, Tenzin, for recommending, recommending me. What a joy to be back virtually in my hometown, just a short distance from Roxbury Latin Academy, and to reminisce a bit of what it was like to grow up in the area of that area in the midst of the civil rights movement. What a pleasure to inform you of the role of those who encouraged me on the proper paths to become a contributing member of society. And indeed, what fun to share my journey from Roxbury to, to Dakar, which was not always easy. I was born in Boston, as you heard, and I'm the youngest of five siblings. And my brothers were very much like a new set of parents. One of my brothers, the former judge of the Boston Superior, uh, Associate Justice of the Boston Superior Court and Chief Justice of the Boston Municipal Court was indeed my father figure for 40 years. My parents passed away when I was 33 and he, Judge Elam, gave me the needed counsel throughout my career. He gave me away when I married and swore me in when I became ambassador at the elegant Benjamin Franklin Room at the State Department. So you can understand I was uniquely blessed to have someone like Judge Elam in my family. I was a very shy and teenager and adolescent. And for years, I was the little Elam girl. I did not like that. And there was a woman who always called me Elamie. And I, I finally, one day, I mustered up enough nerve to say to her, I have a name. My first name is Harriet, and I'm named after Harriet Tubman. And I sort of stomped and walked away. Fortunately, she didn't get back to my parents and say she was not being very respectful. But because my parents, was, my brothers were so much older than I, as I said, I relied on their advice and counsel. And just before I was to enter junior high school, the then Lewis Junior High, in a challenging section of Roxbury, Two of my brothers went to City Hall and said my sister should attend the Patrick T. Campbell School. So off I went. It is now I understand the Martin Luther King Middle School. After the middle of school experience, I was ac accepted at Boston Latin School, Girls Latin School. For me, that was a fate worse than death. After a few months struggling to learn Latin, I pleaded with my parents to please take me out of Latin school. They reluctantly agreed, and I went to the Roxbury Memorial High School for girls. They had no idea, and neither did I, that 20 or 30 years later, I would learn Greek and Turkish. And I will, will admit the Latin training decades earlier proved very helpful. And then when the high school guidance counselor automatically assigned me to the commercial, course, my brothers met with that counselor and insisted that based on my grades, that I merited assignment in the academic track. We all suspected the fact that I was a young, quote, colored girl at that time, that I should automatically enter this commercial course. That was my first encounter 
of subtle discrimination. And my next step from Roxbury High, Memorial High, was to Simmons College and it's now Simmons University on the Fenway. As many students, I wanted very much to go away to school and I was accepted at Georgetown and at Boston University, but my parents made a wise economic decision. Simmons offered me a scholarship and I, was, I ended up going to Simmons without much discussion. Although I was one of only four African-American students at Simmons, I must say that Simmons prepared me for a successful career in the diplomatic service. During my junior year, I traveled to Lyon, France, and thanks to philanthropic Boston businessmen, I received a scholarship to become a member of the Experiment in International Living. This step of my journey changed my life and sparked my desire to live and work abroad. I will never forget the day that I was walking along a street in France with my French sister when someone said, la, la femme noire, comme elle est belle. The black woman, how pretty she is. No wonder, no one in Boston had ever said that to me before, but trust me, they were being very kind because I know what I looked like back then and it wasn't worthy of quite that much praise. Paul Sasser, my friend sister and I have remained friends and stayed in touch for 58 years. This French family saw my picture. They didn't know me. They didn't care about my race. They welcomed me into their home. Suddenly, I realized that my complexion was an asset not a liability. Many of the French people were genuinely curious to talk with me about what life was like in the United States. And on, upon reflection, I may have helped them change their earlier misperceptions about America. Before that international exposure, I had studied hard and did everything I could to prove that I was academically equal to my white counterparts. Whatever my parents directed me to do as the obedient child I did. I met their requirements and at time exceeded their expectations. But in France, I found I could exist without having to justify my place in society. When I spoke to the French about my parents' humble beginnings as part of the great migration, they seized on every word. They were duly impressed with the accomplishments of my siblings, but I reminded them that my family was not unusual. There were many families of color who placed significant value on education and excelled. These positive interactions with the French in 1962 confirmed my decision to work and live abroad. And in the mid nineties, I was able to host that family in my assignment in Istanbul, Turkey. And I was able to say an honest and heartfelt merci beaucoup to them for inspiring me to join the diplomatic service. After several assignments overseas, I received a fellowship to attend the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And everyone said to me, oh, so you're going to study law? I said, no, there's three lawyers, four lawyers in my family. No, I'm only, I'm only going to study public diplomacy. I was 38 years old in classrooms with young men and women who were 21, all of whom had, had attended very respected uh, and well-known colleges and universities. I was slightly uncomfortable. And I must say that when we entered the economic class, one student asked, what is an exchange rate? And I realized, hmm, I think I can handle this. Living and working 17 years abroad, I knew more about international economics than I gave myself credit for. When I finished Fletcher, I received a call from a former ambassador in the Ivory Coast, Monteagle Stearns, who was then vice president or Dep yes, vice president of the National Defense University. And he asked me to become his cultural attache in Athens, Greece. I was sitting at their dinner table and looking around at all of these posters that to me looked like they were in hieroglyphics. And I said to Mr. Ambassador, I could not learn Greek. He said, oh yes, you are French as fluent and I'm sure you could learn Greek. I cautioned him not to be so sure of that. But I told him I was honored to be asked, but career assignments didn't work that way. 
I would have to bid on the position. If chosen, I would have to deal with colleagues thinking that I was setting up a plum assignment for myself since I was then in career counseling. Ambassador Stearns convinced me to bid on the assignment and I did not get the assignment initially because another gent of Greek descent was selected. The then counselor of the US Information Agency sent a note to personnel having interviewed me and said, find something good for Miss Elam, she's impressive. Well, I was not impressed nor taken aback by that praise because I was devastated. I had started studying Greek on my own at the Greek Orthodox Church in Washington, DC, and I was terribly disappointed. Eight months later, I received a phone call from personnel, someone saying to me, how is your Greek? And I told the career counselor on the phone to stop teasing. He said, no, I'm serious, you're going to Athens. The gent who was to be the cultural attache has now moved to become the press attache, and you're going out as the new cultural attache. I was over the moon. Four wonderful years in Athens, Greece, I worked to diligently improve America's image abroad and to remove the misperception Greeks had of America. I believe that I heightened the respect for American artists of all genres. Yes, I learned Greek at 42 and Turkish at 47. And I say that I am sorry to my parents because I did make a mistake in judgment. The result was that I had to learn two hard languages at a mature age and I would not put this on any of my worst enemies. But my diplomatic successes in Greece and Turkey are directly tied to my language fluency. In the mid eighties, the Dance Theater of Harlem performed at the famed Herod Atticus Theater and during, during the Athens Festival. Because there was so much anti-Americanism at the time, the then US ambassador thought that if we had the performance of this wonderful modern ballet dance company be retelecast throughout Greece during the months of summer, it might improve America's image abroad. To counter that, uh, he asked me to negotiate with the dance theater company and the Greek impresario, the broadcast fees or telecast fees. They wanted 110,000, they wanted to pay them in Greek drachma. What was an American country gonna do with Greek drachma? Well, we negotiated the fee down to $40,000. And again, we, were pleased because we asked for the American artist to bridge the political gap to engender a more positive view of the United States. By the mid nineties in Istanbul, Turkey, our ambassador again there asked me to meet with the editorial board of a predominantly Muslim newspaper. My mission was to counter a disinformation campaign which implied that the United States government was feeding Kurdish terrorists. With the superb assistance of my press college, press, Turkish press colleagues, I met with the editorial board of the fundamentalist newspaper. I stated that we did not feed the PKK terrorists. I provided hard evidence to that effect and did so with the utmost respect. All of this was done in Turkish. We, the US, got an apology on the front page of the newspaper the next day. My Turkish colleagues said that in the 30 years they had worked at the Istanbul consulate, they had never seen such an apology appear in a French, a Turkish newspaper. Interestingly, that year I got promoted to the senior foreign service. Once again, if it were not for my knowledge of a language, I would not have been able to make that step on behalf of my country. The effectiveness, my effectiveness throughout my career has really been tied to my language fluency, my ability to communicate in the language of the host country to which I was assigned made all of the difference. You can imagine the immediate impact when you walk towards someone and greet them even with only the amenities and you will see the tension diminish and people begin to 
look at you in a way that you might not have had them view you in the past. You have shown them you give respect to their culture. You are honest. You're willing to know what really makes them tick. And then you are able to read their cultural signals in a way that you couldn't if you didn't study the language. I often refer to the quote by Nelson Mandela who says, said, if you speak to a man in a language that he knows, you speak to his head. But if you speak to him in his language, you speak to his heart. You now have heard several of the positive outcomes of my actions during my career, but I must tell you, I learned a very sobering lesson early on in my assignments in Africa. In 1968, I naively didn't understand why I was not welcomed with open arms. I quickly learned that Americans did not have the historical heft of revered African kingdoms. The Senegalese, Ghanaians, Malians, and Ivoirians knew that my ancestors arrived in the United States on slave ships. I certainly had no right to consider myself equal or more intelligent and that was a much needed wake up call for me. When posted in Abidjan, I invited one of our drivers to sit in on a planning meeting for a speaker. And at the end of that meeting, and actually at the end of my assignment, I was reminded of it again. One of the women of Ivoirian descent who had been trained at the Sohaban said to me, I don't sit in meetings with drivers. You Americans try to democratize everything. That was such a harsh lesson. And I never really gained her respect for the two years I was in Abidjan that I wrote a paper on that in at the Fletcher School. We really cannot superimpose our values on others. We must learn to respect when you are in another country that you are a guest there. So now let me move on to my favorite topic, cultural comp competency. Let's stop for just a moment and think of how America might better leverage the untapped, undertapped comparative advantage that exists in the diverse range of cultural language and aptitudes of its citizens. Let us also reflect on the question, what are the essential requirements for leaders in international affairs in this rapidly changing global environment. The overarching presence of the global pandemic and economic crisis in, is the most obvious place to start. These two issues are transnational threats to the peace and security of our now very fragile world. We are totally interdependent. Just think of where the current conflicts exist, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Iran, Sudan. None of these fall in the category, category of highly industrialized nations. Therefore, I often told my students as they prepare for the foreign service exam that they need to study the history of non-Western civilizations. They need to be at least conversant with these histories. That's the first step becoming more knowledgeable and comfortable in living and working in these cultures is the next and critical step. The current demographic trends in the United States do not simply allow for a more diverse approach to international affairs, but they, are, they, are, they in fact demand one. Given the increasing diversity of American society, Minorities are developing their own perspective on foreign policy, priorities, and patterns. For example, African Americans, Hispanics, and many Asians come from backgrounds where their families are more likely to be at the mid to the bottom of the American social pyramid. While times fortunately have changed, traditionally these groups have been outside of the dominant American institutions. They were historically excluded and marginalized from the Harvard, Stanford's, and the Council on Foreign Relations or the Aspen Institute discussions. 
They come from backgrounds truly different from European cultures. They look back towards Delhi or Lagos, not Dublin or London or Paris. Just imagine what might happen if the US does not include persons with important perspectives from these communities. So therefore we need to determine how best to fashion and implement foreign policies from these varied viewpoints. Otherwise, the United States will fall behind its global competitors. And then to win hearts and minds, there must be a capacity to credibly engage with them. And engage, we must. And on to civility. Today's world is rampant with examples of incivility. But I loved hearing the story on NPR a few months ago of an American soldier whose life was saved by his Afghan interpreter. When the American soldier asked the Afghan interpreter, why did you do this for me? You didn't even know me. The Afghan responded, because you were a guest in my country. Challenges to heal today's society are doubly difficult because in our offline lives, we know we must be civil and refrain from telling colleagues and spirits superiors how much we truly feel. The anger from this restraint boils inside of us. As a result, online conversations free us from consequences. But as Aaron Sorkin once said, don't ever forget that you are a citizen of this world. And there are things you can do to lift the human spirit, spirit, things that are easy, things that are free, things that you can do every day exhibit civility, respect, kindness, and character. Our world is spending so much more time online. For many, it now has become our major source of education, as you know, entertainment, communication, and debate. It is time to let go of the false wall between our online lives and our real ones and act with the same kind of civility on the internet that we do in our day-to-day -day interactions. From the time I became a career diplomat, I recognized as an American, I was a guest in whatever country I was assigned. And I remember my trip to Denmark when I was serving as counselor of USIA, where American diplomats referred to the, the Danes as those people. I immediately reminded the US diplomats in my meeting that they were guests in Denmark. Each US embassy abroad exists only if the host country gives permission for the embassy's presence. Even today, there is evidence of America's arrogance abroad. Sadly, the ugly American, which we all know, surfaces far too often in airports, which we don't see very often these days, but in restaurants and in public places abroad. So my advice to my young students is to always respect the indigenous embassy staffers. They are the lifeblood, the institutional memory of any US embassy. They remain when career diplomats move every two years or three or four years. They deserve the utmost respect and courtesy. Their loyalty to the United States is inspirational. I reflect on the dedication of the locally engaged staffers who came to work at the US Embassy every day immediately following September 11th, 2001. They gave me hope and they certainly countered the stereotypical images that America has abroad. They felt that they could trust us. They felt that we can break down barriers using our face-to-face -face interaction with their, their home country nationals. American diplomats are civil. We are respectful. 
and we do make a difference around the world. Remain, we remain decent in the face of indecency, but we must still aspire to decency. We must practice civility toward one another, admire and emulate ethical behavior wherever we find it, and apply a rigid standard, rigid standard of morality to ourselves. And if periodically we fail, we certainly can ingest our lives, not the standards. So I thank you for being such an attentive audience and demonstrating the essence of civility by not clicking off your screen. And the more that I read about Roxbury Latin Academy, the more I say to myself, if I had a son, I would want him to be one of your classmates. Continue to shine your very special light in this world which sorely needs your creative perspective. And remember that you never touch someone so lightly that you do not leave a trace. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you so much. And thank you for being here with us this morning. Um, I would just remind anyone that has questions that they can submit them through the Q&A. Um, but I have one question for you. Uh, you. In your work at the University of Central Florida with students there, um, you've talked to us about some of the very foundational elements of, of basically the tools that any diplomat needs to do their work successfully. Um, is there anything specific to today, to this moment today, to where we are as a nation, as a world in 2020, that is maybe different from what you know you would have learned at the Fletcher School in your time there? Um, are there conversations about going off into the world um, and being diplomats uh, that are specific to this sort of moment in history um, that are different? Uh, I would say yes. One, we all are suffering from a virus that we can't control. And we never know where we might find the vaccine and which scientists may provide that. IIE has just presented a grant to a young woman from, I believe, Somalia to do research on the COVID vaccine. Um, I would not have talked to my students about respecting scientists from around the world before this happened. Yes, I would have told them to be culturally sensitive, but I would not have spent much time about the fact that many students from other countries who have come to the United States have been Nobel Prize winners who are immigrants to the United States because they brought a special, a significant expertise and a desire to excel because they had left a place of conflict to be contributing members to our society and then to the world. The other I would say is not to rely on what they see on a visual screen. Seeing a person on the screen has been wonderful during COVID-19, but it is not the same for face-to-face -face interaction. You really cannot get a feel for the body language if you're only looking at a person from the neck up. You cannot tell whether they are uh, the, the, the questions that they may have that are often revealed in the manner in which they're seated in a chair and the manner in which they give you eye contact when they have to face to face, uh, that is a, a horse of a very different color. We have access to digital communications and we may think we know a lot about countries without being there, but there is nothing like walking in the mud. It's one thing to see that mud, but walking in it and knowing that there are families who can't socially distance, families who cannot get access to even um, malaria vaccine at this point. But we realize too that they have histories that are far longer than ours, and we have to learn to be humble in our interactions with them. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question here from a senior who uh, is on campus today. And his question is, um, as a diplomat, did you ever have difficulty representing uh, being in a country that hasn't um, always accepted people of color or that had a different idea of what people of color? 
It's an excellent question, and it's one that's been answered both in the, on the Hill and the House of Foreign Affairs Committee's hearings on this subject. Very often, Americans are accepted for being an American, and other countries do not seem to have this constant preoccupation of skin tone. Yes, there is de discrimination around the world, and, and we know about the caste societies in India. We know about certain areas in China where people do not want to get a tan from because it means you've been working in the field, and we find it very odd that Americans who have tans all year long exhibit what is indeed a rel relatively high economic level in the society, which means they could travel to get that tan. Um, I honestly felt that I was accepted more for being an American than being a woman of color. It was more difficult being a woman than being African-American, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Senegal, Mali, the Ivory Coast, France, Belgium, and back to Senegal 28 years later as the US ambassador. Never once did I find my color a disadvantage overseas. Thank you, Ambassador. And I, I just read this question again, and I fear that I misread it, and I don't want to um, uh, skew what the student intended. As a diplomat, did you ever have difficulty representing a country, representing America? That's a very different question. Um, that hasn't always accepted people of color. That's the question I think the student intended. That's, that's a very different question. Uh, very different. I question. often refer to the days of the Cold War when Americans sent jazz artist Louis Armstrong, Stan Getz and others overseas to show off the one indigenous American art form, music, jazz. And it was used to bridge the gap between the East, Eastern Bloc nations, communist nations, nations and American democracies. However, when we began in the civil rights movement, there were demonstrations in the street. Louis Armstrong and Standigatz refused to continue to represent America abroad. And they came back, they stopped their performing artist tours. PBS has done a program on that that is masterfully pre presented as PBS tends to do. I can honestly say for American diplomats of color, it has been difficult in the recent years to represent our country abroad. It is also difficult for a young colleague of mine who happens to be, he's just returned from Be Beijing, a student of mine during the uh, demonstrations in Hong Kong and we've got George Floyd being murdered. What a challenge it had to be to be a young person to analyze the social media input that was coming to the embassy and what, how do you respond? It was not easy. And the talking points are not always apropos, but the one way even in my generation that we were able to bridge that gap was to admit America's mistakes and say that we were always a work in progress. At least we were willing to acknowledge that we had a race problem rather than in some places where it may have existed, mainly in France, um, with the, the, the Africans who lived all in bidonville, many of whom did, and, and I noticed in 62, they were the only people cleaning the metro. We were forthright in acknowledging it, even though we may not have cured the problem, we're make, taking steps to address it. Now that's a pretty high bar to ask any of us to, to get, say, go. But I would also say, if it weren't for certain people who believed in me, none of whom looked like me, my mentors were all white males who saw something in this little black girl of color that they felt they wanted to improve. They are the ones that wrote the recommendations for me to go to graduate school, to be in the senior seminar, to have these opportunities to learn these hard languages. That said a lot to me, and it said that everyone was not what the majority population seemed to view about America. So yes, it was difficult, but you were also always able to say that we are a work in progress. 
On the heels of that question, I have one here from Lucas Numa, who's an eighth grader. And his, Lucas's question is, how have the recent protests and discussions surrounding police brutality and racism affected other countries' views of America? They are, these are not new views, I will say. And if I talked about anti-Americanism in Greece, that was, I was in Greece from 83 to 87, Turkey from 90 through 94. Um, they know about America's faults. They, that is no secret. The worst things about America are often promulgated on the, on the media around the world. But what was different in how it affected the rest of the world is that it was, it involved students of every race, color, creed, men and women of all generations, LGBT communities, all were represented in these demonstrations, which gave those around the world who wanted to have a voice, a feeling that they could indeed emulate their frustrations in their own countries. And as a result, we saw global demonstrations that talked about the inequities that existed in countries around the world. So despite the horrendous death of George Floyd, he certainly changed much of the world. I have a question here from senior Nick Rossidi and his question is, as a diplomat, have you ever had to represent a position that you didn't agree with personally? And if so, how did you navigate that situation? When you take an oath of office to become an ambassador, you make that oath to the constitution and you know full well that you have a dissent channel in the foreign service, that if you disagree with the policy, you can send that to the secretary of state and it has to be answered within 48 hours. If the response is not something to your liking and if your sense of integrity and your moral compass says you cannot do this any longer, then you resign. But I must tell you that I haven't seen Yes, during when we first went into Iraq, two or three colleagues I know resigned because they felt we should not have gone into Iraq. Yes, they wrote books and made a bit of money, but they, you begin to wonder, can you not have a public presence without losing your sense of self and your own integrity? It is not easy, but when you take that oath, you know that you're going to work for different administrations. I worked for six different presidents. And I did not agree with them all. But I also felt that having lived in nine, 10 different countries, I felt that the United States was still one of the best places in the world to live. I would not retire and live anywhere else. I have a question here from faculty member uh, Usman Jap. And his question is, uh, has visiting and being a diplomat for other countries changed your opinion on America? Yes, we are not that, not the know-all, we're not that 800 pound gorilla that I thought we were when I was 29, 28 years old. I found that out in my first experience and I guess I was maybe 27 or 26 when I went to Senegal and when Senghor was still president and Senator Brooks delegation went and I went with my brother who was then a senior advisor to Senate, Senator Edward Brooke. I found that I had so much to learn about respect for elders. I did not know in terms of the role of families and the fact that I didn't see anyone who was really an orphan. People took people in, children in to raise them. But what really inspired me was I was in a country where well, yes, my brother was a black judge, but I was in a country where the entire Supreme Court was black. I had never experienced that kind of thing as a woman of color in my young age. And I had to stop and think, hmm, America has a lot to learn. The Turkish delegates that I traveled with to NATO countries, they never spoke and asked a question to the, the NATO advisors without making sure the doyen, the dean of the group, who was always the oldest one, gave them an acknowledgement that yes, it was all right to ask the question. I learned a lot about cultural 
traditions that are carried on to this day that help us understand the importance of honor, trust, and integrity. Um, I have a question uh, here. What current national, I'm sorry, what current international events should we pay the greatest attention to, in your opinion? I think what's going on in Yemen and in the Sudan. But there is so, there is so, all of this is co colored by the pandemic. But I also think that um, if we were a, a bit more knowledgeable about what happens also in terms of the Syrian refugees who are all on the coast, of, many of them on the coast of Greece. Uh, one of the winners of a scholarship in my name is a young med student who was to go and help those who were studying in us not studying, who were refugees in Lesbos. Well, she's not able to go, of course, because of the coronavirus. She, this the scholarship was given on March 7th before the 13th became part and parcel of our history. But I do think that we need to listen to the criticisms of America through the eyes of BBC, Euro News, and not only the American, even the 24 hour media, the CNN has one international channel. Because we will then find out what is important in the world. And I, I made it a requirement for my students to bring me the headlines of five international journals. Each day we were in the class twice a week for a three hour session so that they knew what they should be looking at in the world view, not what some celebrity decided to have a divorce with so-and-so or having an affair with someone. That was not worthy of my time. And they learned and they became interested in learning about those issues. So I would still say, I would say Yemen, I would say the Syrian refugee crisis, and I would say the Sudan as well. I have one more question. We might have time for one more after this. We'll see. Um, but I have a question here from Hababaj, who's in uh, grade seven. And his question is, have you seen examples of racism in your travels that is not black and white, but is something else entirely? Uh, and what do you think it is? It's, it's anything that is uh, outside the norm of what history in the United States has given people to, to view as what is at the top of the pecking order, a white Anglo-Saxon male. Again, PBS has done a series on civilizations that talks about how people were perceived back in ancient times until the present. Um, I've been in airports, I've been on planes, I've been in places where people were dressed in such a way that I, uh, even I or my then housekeeper from the Philippines said, oh my heavens, what a difficult life, because the woman's face was covered completely with a metal eye covering on the hijab. I got off a plane and in I think it was Abu Dhabi and I was the only woman in the delegation and there were 12 men waiting to greet us. And even with all the cultural studies I had done, I wasn't quite sure what to do. And then I got, even I got angry because I saw all the men in white and the women in black. And then I listened to, then I, I bought a book that ta taught me the, ex the reasons why people wear what they wear and the importance thereof. And I became far more knowledgeable and comfortable. But I have seen that discrimination, yes. And it's not based on color of skin. You could be white as the driven snow. And if you're, you're wearing uh, a hijab and a, total, a totally covered people who are not knowledgeable and haven't traveled around the world, anything that is unusual is to many threatening. To me, it was always curious. I was always curious to know more about it. I think we have time for one more question here. And this is also from a 60, we call them 60s, he's a grade seven here. Um, his name is Aspen Johnson. And Aspen's question is, over the years of traveling and working under various presidents, how have your political views changed, if at all? 
we in America always talked about having a democracy, but we really can't say that we have a functioning democracy when we have an electoral college. Try to explain that to everybody every four years when I had to run an American, you know, what we always had to do an ed an election night event in posts around the world. That was the most difficult. But er, my early times in, in Africa, I noticed that they had what, what they called uh, certain kind of socialism. And it made sense, scientific socialism, whatever the adjective was, it made sense for the society in which they were functioning. Uh, the economic, the formal and informal aspects of economic, economics was fascinating to me and it sometimes worked, the informal sector worked better than the formal sector. And yet I, I spent a lot of time in Senegal working with the informal sector. Um, there are countries that survive very well on a different form of democracy because it works for them. And so once again, I learned that you can't superimpose your values on some other country. And I had to sit back and watch and see how it worked and realize that our version really was not going to help them. But my one comment I must say, when it comes to the freedom of the press and journalism, in the early 70s when I was in Senegal, I remember working with Senegalese journalists to get um, journalists to at least write stories that were based on three or four sources before they were printed in the paper. Uh, what a joy to come back to Senegal almost 38, 30 years later as ambassador and see that that had been, that attempt and those workshops had been so effective that in the election of Abdullah Wad, there were no the, well, we had cell phones too. There were very few inconsistencies that got away, that they got away with in the voting just areas in a part of the country with, which was truly rural, but they had a sense of integrity in their reporting and they were incredibly tied to the goals and values that we had tried to instill 30 years earlier. Ambassador, thank you so much for your great answers and for your time this morning. And um, we're, we're just at time, so I'm just going to leave. let Mr. Brennan sort of sign us off here. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you so much, Ambassador, for your eloquent elaboration of your inspirational story. Uh, so much of what you say provides us what, with what I think is a compelling example of leading and serving. And you know that that's a pillar of our own mission. So I hope that the boys were paying attention. Uh, to your remarks that they imagine themselves in your shoes and that more and more of Roxbury Latin graduates go on to public service, especially foreign service. That would really yes. be wonderful. Uh, for their support of, of these initiatives, I'm grateful again for the Hennessy's and for recommending you. Uh, again, thank you, Tenzin, for making that possible. Thanks again, Ambassador, for being with us. You're welcome anytime. I hope that when you get back to Boston, you'll time. come and see us in person. And I, thank look, you. I look forward to doing that. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Thanks for being such an attentive audience, too. Have a good day. Bye. Do likewise. Thank you, Aaron. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.